the heart of the Christian ethic, the preparedness to suffer for others. And that takes a lot of courage. And so the key issue for, 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 for us is helping people understand that the, the root of compassion is courage. And when you're working with clients, at the root of the compassion that you help them develop is courage. Developing the courage to begin to face the trauma of the abuse. The agoraphobia begins to develop the courage to go out, to face the anxiety, to face the fear of having a heart attack or whatever it is. The obsessional person begins to develop the courage to bit by bit take on the obsession. So let's think about the evidence then. What about the evidence? Is this developing this inner compassion motivational system? So this is the self I want to become. This is what I'm going to cultivate. What is the data? It's going to be brief, I'm afraid. Well, we know, and there's quite a lot of evidence now, that if you practice imagining compassion from others, you can actually produce changes, physiological changes, which are measurable in the frontal cortex. And the reason for this is because we now know the brain is far more plastic than was ever understood even 15 years ago. It's called neuroplasticity. The brain produces about five to 6,000 new brain cells each day. That's called neurogenesis. And those cells go to areas where they're being stimulated, where they're being used. So this is very exciting work because psychologists really are beginning to get onto this. And incidentally, the psychologists around the world are doing a lot of this physiological stuff and compassion because supposedly we can develop trainings for people that will actually have an impact on how their brains and bodies are. Wouldn't that be amazing? Loving kindness meditation, this is Barbara Fredrickson's things work, increases positive emotions, mindfulness, feelings of purpose in life, sense of social support. Compassion meditation just for six weeks actually improves immune function. So yeah, these are not psycholog just psychological phenomena, they're actually changing major physiological systems. And the paper that came out just recently, helping others, this study looked at the degree to which people were helping others in their communities, they're actually poor communities, actually um, predicts reduced mortality specifically by buffering the association between stress and mortality. So if you're an individual who likes helping other people, this is good for you. This thing was studied by Jennifer Crocker and Caravaglio. They looked at compassion self-image goals, which were assessed by 13 items, all began with the phrase, in the past week, in the area of friendships, how much did you want to try to do the following? So for um, compassion goals it was, well, I wanted to be supportive, I wanted to have compassion for others' mistakes and weaknesses, avoid doing anything that would be harmful to others, make a positive difference to somebody's life, be constructive, etc. But there's also what they call ego goals, or what we would call shame avoidant goals, which is, I wanted to get others to recognize or acknowledge your positive, my positive abilities, qualities, convince others that you are right, avoid showing your weakness, avoid the possibility of being wrong. So there's a little shame avoidant, right? And you can imagine what the data tells you. But if you're motivated, if you're orientated to be compassionate, if that's what you're focusing on with your friends, then compassion goals predicts closeness, clear and concerned feelings, increased social support and trust over the semester, whereas the more self-image goals you had, the less that was the case. And if you had a high self-image goals, you're very concerned about being seen as weak or whatever it is, that produced uh, predicted conflict, loneliness, and confused feelings and so on. And so we know now that we don't know, and there's been many other studies as well, that shows us that actually uh, the motivations that you have in your relationships have a major impact on a whole range of stuff. So basically then, what we're suggesting is, in order for us to deal with this tricky brain, we're going to be doing this. We're going to be teaching people the importance of understanding that the human brain is a serious problem because you can very easily tip it into doing bad things. Not, not people's fault, but if we can train people to be mindful, okay, and if we train people to have compassion and motivation at the heart of their being, this will have a major impact on how that brain is. And for those of you who are clinical psychologists, it is the context, it is the supports around which you then do your intervention. <laughs> so we say building compassion is like climbing Mount Everest, right? If you want to climb Mount Everest, it's a good idea to get fit first. 
So if you're going to start working with people who are very frightened or whatever it is, it's a good idea to build capacity in the breathing, in the body, in the parasympathetic system, and then start working with the things that are frightened of. In terms of the evidence of CFT, um, well, we, we did a study some time ago, I did it in the day hospital. I went to my day hospital, I work in the day hospital, and I went to my, to my the people there. I said, look, I've got, I've got this thing called Compassion Focus Therapy, and I'd like to do a group, would you do a group with me? And they said, oh, not another one, you're glad therapy skill. But I said, no, this one's going to work, I promise you, it's all right. Anyway, so um, my um, um, uh, signed up for us, and um, they were fantastic, and they told us what we were doing wrong, and what had happened, and so on. So we showed major changes in shame and suffering. I mean, these are people who have been in the service a long time. Um, <clears throat> Lorna Judge, who's actually here in Glasgow, did a lovely study with uh, 27 clients in community mental health, school, sorry, mental health teams, and again, showed significant reductions in depression, anxiety, shame, and self-criticism. Self-criticism, you see, is a thing that we often go after because if you have a self-critic in your head, what you're going to be doing is stimulating the threat system day in, day out. Okay. That, that voice will stimulate it in your head. And actual fact, that's how we started in compassion focused therapy. We were doing cognitive therapy and people could do alternative thinking, you know, could generate alternative thoughts, uh, but the emotional texture of those thoughts was very negative. So I remember one lady, she had been adopted in, into a very bad environment and she felt unlovable and unwanted. But she'd had a good marriage and she had daughters who loved her, so she was able to write those down as alternative thoughts. Right? So, yes, I know that my husband loves me and my kids love me, but when I look at it written down like that, it doesn't do anything for me. I know it's true, but. So, so what, how are you actually hearing it in your mind? She said, Well, what do you mean? I said, what, What's the tone? She said, Well, you know. I said, Well, speak it out as you hear it. She said, What? So, you're having cognitive therapy, huh? Wow, look at the evidence, right? You got a husband who loves you, you got children who love you. For God's sake, that's black and white thinking, isn't it? So the tone and the emotional tone. So um, we said to her, well, maybe we could just change the tone, you know, get a kind tone to the alternative thoughts. And that proved a lot more difficult than we thought. You see the thing, the tone, the emotional context of what how you say things is important. I could say to you, uh, everybody wants to be happy. And I could say to you, contentiously, everybody wants to be happy. Or I could say, everybody wants to be happy. Or I could say, sexy, everybody wants to be happy. <laughs> I mean, man. <laughs> Another study here, Heather Lakewake, Janice Harper, looking at uh, people with psychosis and costumes once again. Uh, some major changes in uh, the measures that we usually measure, shame and so on and so on. And another study that again was done here in Glasgow, I picked out Glasgow once by Christian Brailler and the team, which was an RCT looking at people with psychosis. And the great thing about this trial was the fact that in building a compassion group, they actually were facilitating being compassion to each other. So when you're doing compassion groups, you're not doing challenging thoughts and all that stuff. Developing the capacity to be empathic and mentalize each other. Okay. So I want to just finish off now by talking a little bit about how can we widen the focus? Because basically, how do we get these basic ideas that psychology, psychological science over the last 20 years have proved, in my view, without a shadow of a doubt, Compassionate motivations are physiologically very powerful. There are lots of other things as well, you know, social relationships and all, you know, other stuff. But I'm just going to focus on the physiological side. How can we bring it into healthcare? How can we bring it into relationship building? How can we help couples understand how to be compassionate to each other? How to deal with conflict? How can we bring it into organisations and schools? How can we make compassionate communities? You heard a, a wonderful talk by. Um, Tony and Emma uh, about the, ch uh, um, the children's pro um, young people's project just earlier on. And the reason for this is because compassion organizes your mind, it's a motivational system. If you're competitive, right, if you're focused on being a banker and making a lot of money, then the way you think about yourself and your relationships, the things that give you pleasure, are going to be very different than if you have that one. 
So one of the ways in which we've been talking to people within organizations is the following. We'd like you to imagine that there are two different motivated systems. One is uh, competitive, threat-based competitive, and the other is affiliative. Supposing that you think about this, how will this organize the mind, your mind, or the mind of your employer, employee? How will it affect your job role? If you're being very competitive, how will that affect what you do in your job? In comparison to if you're being very compassionate or if you're cooperative, how does it affect how your job role, you relate your job role to your team colleagues? Do you really want to have a whole lot of individualistic, competitive people who are trying